Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Fullerton, and today's topic is the standard model of particle physics. Objectives are going to be to understand that atomic particles are composed of subnuclear particles, to explain how the nucleus is a conglomeration of quarks, which combine to form protons and neutrons, to understand that each elementary particle also has a corresponding antiparticle, utilizing standard model diagrams to solve basic particle physics problems, and finally, to list the known fundamental forces in the universe and rank them in order of relative strength. So a little bit of a longer topic here. To begin with, let's talk about atoms. An atom is the smallest part of an element that has the characteristics of that element. And as I'm sure you're aware, they're made up of a nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons. The protons are positive, the neutrons are neutral, and they're surrounded by electrons, which are negative, much smaller. In the 1930s, scientists started to discover even smaller particles, though, and that launched the particle physics movement. One of the things they started discovering was antimatter. Antimatter is just matter that's made up of particles with the same mass as the regular particles, but either the opposite charge or another opposite characteristic. For example, an antiproton has the same mass as a proton, but it has a negative charge. An antineutron has the same mass as a neutron. It can't have an opposite charge as a neutron because there is no charge on the neutron. But it has an opposite magnetic moment. And a positron, or an anti-electron, they mean the same thing, has the same mass as an electron, but it has a positive charge. So antimatter is the same mass as the regular particle, but it has the opposite charge or an opposite other characteristic. Now, when matter particles and the corresponding antimatter particle meet, they can annihilate each other. That means you have the complete conversion of both particles into energy, using our formula E equals mc squared. And all of our conservation laws still apply. Conservation of mass energy, conservation of charge, and conservation of momentum. Let's see how that works in a sample problem. If we have a proton and an antiproton collide and completely annihilate each other, how much energy is released? and we're given that the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. To find the energy released, we can use E equals mc squared, where our mass is going to be the mass of a proton plus the mass of an antiproton. And since their mass is the same, that's just going to be 2 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms times c squared, the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, squared. Or, when I plug that into my calculator, I come up with about 3 times 10 to the minus 10 joules, which is a tremendous amount of energy for such a very small mass. Now, we can also talk about the fundamental forces in the universe. And we've talked about forces already in this course. But when we really get down to fundamentals, to the basics, we're aware of four fundamental forces in the universe. And they are, from strongest to weakest, the strong nuclear force. That's the force that holds all of those particles together in the nucleus. How do you have protons really close to each other in the nucleus and they don't fly apart? Well, the strong nuclear force together is much stronger than the electrostatic repulsion. But that strong nuclear force only acts at a very, very, very close distance. It doesn't have a lot of range. Next strongest is the electromagnetic force. And we've talked about that. Electrical and magnetic attraction and repulsion forces. The weak force is responsible for radioactive decay in the nucleus. And finally, the weakest is the gravitational force, the attractive force between objects with mass. So, another sample problem. Particles in the nucleus are held together primarily by the strong force, the gravitational force, the electrostatic force, or the magnetic force. And of course, the answer, what holds the particles in the nucleus together, is the strong nuclear force. Answer one. Which fundamental force is primarily responsible for the attraction between protons and electrons? The attraction between protons and electrons? Well, if you recall, the electromagnetic force is responsible for the attraction between these charged particles. Now, yes, there would be some attraction due to gravity between those particles, but the electrostatic force is much stronger. So our best answer here is going to be 4. Now, in the 1960s, scientists started putting together what we call the standard model of particle physics. It was a mental model of really what happens when you break down atoms into even smaller pieces. 
It explains the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak force. But it doesn't really do a good job yet of explaining the gravitational force. If you've heard of all of the work that's being done to try and find this Higgs boson, it was being done at Fermilab here in the United States, and now a lot of work going on at CERN in France and Switzerland. That's a means of trying to better improve, better understand this standard model and how gravity plays into it. So, if we start with the standard model, it can get pretty complicated, but we're just going to touch on the very, very, very tip of the iceberg. The standard model says that all matter can be subdivided into two types, hadrons and leptons. Leptons only have three of the fundamental forces acting on them. The strong nuclear force doesn't act on them. So leptons tend to be things like electrons. On the other side, Hadrons are a type of matter on which all four fundamental forces act. And we can subdivide hadrons even further. Baryons are things that we're familiar with. Things like protons and neutrons fall under the heading of baryons. And what's neat about baryons is they always have a charge that is a whole number. 1e, minus 1e, things like that. You never have portions of an elementary charge there. And every baryon is made up of three quarks or antiquarks. Mesons, on the other hand, are things that are made up of a quark and an antiquark. And we don't hear about those very often. Now, quarks we can subdivide further. There are six main types of quarks we're familiar with. And they kind of have funny names. Names like the up quark, the charm quark, the top quark the down quark, the strange quark, and the bottom quark. That's not really telling you what they do. That's just the name that's given to them. And the symbols for those are U, C, T, D, S, and B. And each of these quarks has an associated charge. For example, an up quark has a charge of plus two-thirds of an elementary charge, or two-thirds of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So earlier, if you recall, we talked about an elementary charge. You couldn't get any smaller than that. Well, later on, physicists found out that wasn't quite true. You can break those down into thirds when you start talking about quarks. Now, those are the six main types of quarks, but for every main type of quark, there's also an anti-quark version of a quark. So if we have an up quark that has a charge of plus two-thirds E, there is also an anti-up quark, which we would write as U with the line over it, the symbol with the line over top. That's the anti-quark, and it would have a charge of negative two-thirds E. So we said that you needed three different quarks in order to make up a baryon. For example, a proton would be made up of an up quark, another up quark, and a down quark. So plus two-thirds E, plus two-thirds E, that'd be four-thirds of an elementary charge, and minus one-third E, the charge on a down quark, would give you the charge on a proton, plus one E. A neutron, on the other hand, is an up quark, plus two-thirds E, and two down quarks, minus one-third E, minus one-third E, which is why its charge is zero. So, what is the charge of the down antiquark? That's kind of tough to do unless you have either that table in front of you or you know and have memorized all of these quarks. So let's put the table in front of us and say, what is the charge of the down antiquark? Well, if down is minus one-third E, then the anti-down must have the opposite charge, or one-third of an elementary charge. Sample problem five. Compared to the mass and charge of a proton, an antiproton has... Well, this is just the definition of antimatter. The antiproton has the same mass, but the opposite charge. So this answer must be three. The same mass and opposite charge of the proton in an antiproton. Now, we talked about there being six types of quarks and then six antiquarks. The other side of the coin, we also have six types of leptons and six antileptons. And the types of leptons, the most common, the one you're most familiar with, is probably the electron. Its symbol is E, and it has a charge of minus one elementary charge. But you can also talk about leptons like a muon, a tau, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. And for each of these, again, there is the opposite particle, the antimatter version. So the electron, written as E, has a charge of minus one elementary charge. 
the anti-electron, which we call a positron, E with the line over it, would have a charge of plus one elementary charge. Sample problem six. A particle unaffected by an electric field could have a quark composition of... Well, if a particle's not affected by an electric field, it must be neutral. So we need to find a combination of quarks here that will give us zero charge. To do that, I need to look at my table to see the different charges. And in order to not be, electric not be affected by the electric field, I need something like a charm quark plus two-thirds E plus a strange minus one-third plus another strange minus one-third. So number one, CSS, would be plus two-thirds E minus one-third E for the strange and minus one-third E for the other strange for a total charge of zero. That must be the answer. No charge, so it's not affected by the electric field. What is the charge of an anti-strange quark in coulombs? Well, again, I either need to have that table memorized or I need it in front of me. So I'll find the strange quark first. The strange quark has a charge of minus 130E. So the anti-strange quark must have a charge of plus 130E, which is going to be one-third times the elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which comes out to be right around 5.33 times 10 to the minus 20 coulombs. So there is a lot to this standard model, but most of it you can get just by using common sense and using the information around you to answer the basic questions that are typically asked in standardized type testing. Hopefully that gets you started with the standard model of particle physics. If you need more help or are looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.